in replacement of uh, Peter Riggers, who was not able to come to Lecce for several reasons. Yeah, it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to announce this lecture uh, because we know each other for many years now. And uh, yeah, it's my duty to introduce uh, Stas uh, Stupkiewicz to you. Uh, he is, uh, say, one of the younger generation member, uh, prominent member of the uh, very well-known Polish uh, solid mechanics school. Uh, Stanislav uh, is professor at the Institute of Fundamental Technological Research, uh, IPPT, uh, of the Polish Academy of Sciences in, in Warsaw. Uh, he graduated from the Warsaw University of Technology uh, in Mechanical Engineering uh, and he got his PhD from the IPBT in 1996 uh, and uh, also the habilitation from the IPBT in 2006. Uh, since uh, 2011, he is full professor at uh, IPPT, and uh, yeah, he is uh, around the world where you are. Uh, he also will be, perhaps, yeah. Uh, for instance, he spent one year in Trento uh, at the university as a uh, yeah, guest professor visiting professor. Uh, his research interests are manifold, micromechanics, interfaces, uh, uh, interface layers, uh, uh, multi-scale modeling, uh, computational mechanics, plasticity, contact mechanics, uh, and uh, yeah, today he will talk about interfacial energy and he here in this field, he is a real expert, uh, and we are looking forward uh, to hear about the role of interfacial energy uh, in microstructure formation. Yeah, Stash, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Welcome to this talk. Thanks for coming. Um, before I start, I should say that this is a great pleasure to be here in, in Lecce for this, for this GAM conference and a big honor for me to, to have this plenary lecture. So I wish to thank the organizers, the GAM Association, Giorgio, for, for having me invited, having invited me, sorry. Um, before I go to the technical topics, I want to acknowledge my co-authors so Henrik Petrich is underlined, he's professor at my institute, my colleague, and this is most, in, he's the co-author of most of the, of, the, of the results I will be presenting, and there are two more colleagues, Grzegorz Maciejewski and Karel Duma, that work on, with us also on some specific topics on that. Okay, so what, what I'm going to talk today about is, is about interfaces, interfacial energy, and the related science effects in, in uh, Martin Zittig microstructures. And the two keywords that are missing in the title are shape memory alloys and micromechanics. So what we do is a micromechanical approach. We want to link the scales, and as you will see, we want to include the interfacial energy contributions in, in, these, in these scale transition schemes. And the application field is shape memory alloys, the class of materials that has been introduced this morning by Ferdinando Auricchio, and I want to thank the organizers for hiring Ferdinando to do an introduction for me, so I can shorten a little bit in, in, the, in, the, in the introduction. So here is the outline of my talk, and I will start with the introduction, short on shape memory alloys, more about the microstructures, the martensitic microstructures, which are the, the real beauty of these materials. I will also try to explain why we, oops, why we need, why it's worth to look at the microstructures, at the, at the, micro at the, at the phenomena at the micro scale. And then I will talk a little bit about the interfacial energy in general, and then our main contribution about microstructure interfaces and, and elastic uh, microstrain energy. 
and then I will introduce you the energy minimization framework and I'll show you some, some examples, some applications. Okay, so shape memory alloys, we have had a lot about it this morning, so you can change the shape. Essentially, the material remembers the shape. You imagine a spoon, which when you put it into hot water, it bends. You remove it, it straightens back, and you can do it repeatedly. So it's a nice application. It's not very technological, but there are technological applications which we have seen this morning. What is behind this peculiar behavior is a crystallographically reversible martensitic phase transformation. By, by saying crystallographically reversible, I mean that the crystallographic structure is not changed. Of course, it's not reversible in a thermodynamic sense, for sure. And there are some specific alloys. The most commercially used is nickel titanium, but there are other ones we will also use here in this, as an example, copper aluminum nickel. Okay, so a bit more about the martensitic phase transformation. It's a solid to solid phase transformation, and we, we ex it exhibits change of crystalline structure at a critical temperature or stress. The transformation can be induced either by temperature or by stress, so that at high temperature, we have a austenite, austenitic phase, which, is, which has a higher symmetry, and it's stable at higher temperature, and then we have martensite, which is a lower symmetry, lower temperature phase. And that the transformation is displaced, so there is no diffusion involved, which means that it can occur pretty fast, and as I already said, it's crystallographically reversible. So because we have the change of symmetry, there are several variants of martensite. The change of symmetry induces the multiplicity of variants, and here you, have a, you see an example of a cubic to tetragonal transformation when if you take a cubic unit cell of austenite, it can elongate, you can elongate it along three axes so that you get a tetragonal unit cell of martensite. So you have three variants in that case, but don't be misled. There are other alloys, where, other transformation, for instance, cubic to monoclinic, where there are 12 variants like that. And there is some transformation, some inelastic strain. We call it a transformation strain, or in the finite deformation framework, that would be a transformation stretch, which is related to this change of, 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 crystallographic, of, of crystallographic lattice. So we have these two main shape, me shape memory effects. It's pseudo-elasticity, and uh, I will say a few more about that. So you, you, you have material at relatively high temperature. You start loading. It responds elastically, and certainly, at a certain moment, something happens, which seems to be like plasticity, but it's not plasticity, it's, it's phase transformation. So you load, you load, until you completely transform your material. So then there is something like apparent hardening, and the response is, is again elastic, but in the new phase, the phase that you have in, induced by the transformation, by the stress-induced transformation. But what is also peculiar, when you unload, you have a reverse transformation, so that in an ideal world, you come back to the initial state with no, no residual stress, strain. Uh, there's also the, the, the shape memory effect, which involves changes in temperature. Auricchio already was, uh, Ferdinando was uh, say, saying more about that. So I will not elaborate more. Okay. Applications, there were several applications. This one was not there, so one of the applications is also beautiful applications in orthodontic wires, where you use beautifully the, the, this lower lower part of the hysteresis loop in the pseudoelastic uh, response of the material, highly efficient material for, for this purpose, and also stents, which we have seen. So I not, don't elaborate more. I just want to do some small advertising. What I will be showing will be micromechanical modeling, but we also do macroscopic or, or phenomenological modeling, and here is, here is the example. And uh, apart from advertising, I just want also to, at this point to say that why we need micromechanical approaches. We want to understand what's happening in the material during the transformation, during, the, during its, its work, during uh, loading, unloading, etc. But also, we, the micromechanical modeling has the potential to pro provide material data for micro microscopic models so that you can calibrate or uh, identify your model, you can even design your model, your microscopic model using the, the results of, of micro-mechanical analysis. So that's the ultimate goal of such analysis. Okay, so if we, if, if we look low, at the, with, with, we take a magnifying glass and look at the material, 
which undergoes this Martin Zeke phase transformation, what we see are microstructures. And the microstructures, Martin Zeke microstructures, are at the very essence of, the, of, the, of, the, of these materials. So here you see some examples of the microstructures. So on top left you see a grain in a polycrystalline material with stress-induced uh, martensitic plates. So you have the whole grain which transforms into some zones. In, in, in each zone in particular you see laminates of martensitic plates and the parent austenitic phase. And then if you look in deeper into the martensitic phase, not in this particular material, but in many cases, the martensite itself has a substructure, which is twinned structure. You have the martensite, what seems from, the, from, from far away, seems to be uniform material. If you look close enough, it, it very often has a substructure of, of a laminate. These are two, two variants, two twin, sorry, two twin related, two twin related variants of martensite, and here you see a beautiful sharp interface, uh, sharp, I mean, macroscopically sharp planar interface between austenite and twinned martensite. And here you have also see some two examples of much more complex microstructure that may occur in these materials, and there are many, many more if you, if you look in the, in the literature. So we will be looking at the microstructures, and in particular at the interfaces, as you will see, Yes, and, and in particular, also we, we will look at, at the laminates because we like laminates. We know how to, how to treat them, so we will use these materials. So what is the origin of the microstructure? The origin is the, it's typically associated with the, the fact that the free energy of a material undergoing phase transformation is non-convex. Therefore, you, if you see such a sketch of a too, too well free energy with two, min two minima at some specific strains. If you are somewhere in between, the way to minimize energy is to mix the two variants, the two phases, and then in this way you can lower, you can lower the, the energy. So this is the natural origin of the, of the microstructure. And uh, this also brings naturally the concept of minimizing the energy. So, so what we, we try in our modeling approaches, we try to mimic that by applying energy minimization approaches to, to, to simulate what's happening in the material. If we consider evolution of the microstructures, evolution requires some, is, is associated with some dissipation of energy, and this means that in that case we have to apply some incremental energy minimization uh, approaches, and I will talk about that a little bit later. But this, at the moment, it doesn't say nothing, anything about the characteristic dimensions of the microstructure. And that will be the main theme of this, of this talk. Okay, so this is a, just an illustration of the very classical piece of, of, of theory, which, which allows us to explain the formation of this austenite twinned martensite interface. This is so-called crystallographic theory of martensite. This is the name which is living in the mathematical and mechanical community. The crystallographers, they call it phenomenological theory. And essentially, you start from the energetical considerations, but at the end, you, con you, 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 you just solve some geometrical compatibility conditions. So this corresponds to formation of the microstructure at zero stress. And there are, there are equations which express compatibility of, of the formation gradients in individual phases, in principle, uh, uh, rank one connectivity of, 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 of the formation gradients. It doesn't matter. We know how to write these equations. We also know how to solve them. So starting from this geometrical compatibility, we can obtain all the microstructural parameters of this microstructure, orientation of interfaces, volume fraction of, of twins, etc. What you cannot do, you cannot say anything about what's in this gray layer here, symbolically denoted. The transition layer is unknown. We don't know what is the microstructure. What, we don't know what, is the, what, what are the characteristic dimensions, the twin spacing in that case. This is, the theory does not say about that. So if we look again at the, at the whole chain of modeling that you would have to apply to model these materials. We see that immediately that this is a multi-scale phenomenon. You can distinguish several scales if you want to model the response of a polycrystalline material. You have to consider domains, maybe in the grain, and laminates, and then sublaminates, and etc., down to the atomic scale. So there is, of course, a need for, for multi-scale for multi 
multi-scale modeling. But if we also look at this, at, this, at this picture from another perspective, we see that we have everywhere we have interfaces. Microstructure means, means we have interfaces. And so we have to consider these interfaces on, in, on the microstructures which evolve, which change, which, is, which brings additional complexity, but it also brings us some beauty because this is exactly what we will be looking at, because each interface carries some interfacial energy, and I will elaborate more, elaborate more on that. And then, as you will see, interfacial energy and the balance of different contributions, it governs size effects, so that if you consider these, these issues, you can try to predict characteristic dimensions of the microstructure, grain size dependence of the macroscopic response, or things like that. Okay. Of course, on the market, there are plenty of, 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 of models, of multi-scale models for shape memorialoids. Here I list some, just a very small, very small subset of the, of the available uh, micromechanical multi-scale models for shape memorialoids. The, the, the one, they, 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 they consider plenty of effects, very important, less important, but what none of them considers are the size effects, essentially. Because all the traditional way of, of modeling is to use volume fractions. When you use volume fractions, you don't, you don't really consider the, the, the dimensions of the microstructure. You don't have the, the size-dependent contributions in your, in your system. So you cannot. None of the models of the available models does it, essentially. So our goal is actually to do that, to, get, to fill that gap. So in this talk, I will try to show you our point of view on, on the on the on, on martensitic transformations in, in shape memory alloys. In particular, I will show some re results of our recent work on micromechanics, including estimation of the interfacial energy of elastic microstrains, then how to include the interfacial energy into micromechanical modeling schemes, and finally having some, uh, some simple model, I will try to show you also the related uh, size effects. And also, on top of that, I will very briefly so show you some of our very recent results on phase field modeling of, of, of martensitic microstructures. So I will not elaborate on this last point very much, so just I will give you a very brief introduction to phase field modeling for those who, who, who don't know, although probably maybe it's not that needed. Anyway, if we consider an interface between two phases and we think of an axis C passing from one phase to the other, we can introduce a parameter P which varies between 0 and 1, and, and you could think of a sharp interface when you have a jump in this P, but you can also introduce a smooth, diffuse interface concept when this P varies smoothly with some characteristic length L, which would describe the thickness of the, of the interface. And then, of course, this concept has some benefits from the point of view of numerics. You, can, you, you have smooth functions, so we, we know that smooth functions are better than the, the non-smooth functions from the last talk. So indeed, they are also better from, from our point of view for, for modeling. So how, how we use this, this smooth uh, representation, we introduce the free energy, which, con which, which, con which is composed of the bulk composition, which, con which depends, for instance, on the strain and on this order parameter P, and some, the other contribution, which is defined in the volume, but which describes the interface and it, it depends on, the, on this order parameter and its gradient. And doing that, combining it with some dissipation potential and, uh, and formulating kind of a minimization for a rate potential, by minimizing this, we can get equilibrium equations by minimizing it with respect to the, to the, to the displacement velocities and also evolution equations of Ginzburg-Landau Ginzburg type for the, order, for the order parameter. And there are some characteristic uh, uh, references related to Martin City transformation, but again, there are plenty on the market. Okay, so that much about of the introduction. Now we go to interfacial energy. So what do we mean by interfacial energy? So let's take a look at the picture of, of austenite twinned martensite interface. So this is if we look close enough, we see that it's not a sharp, in, it's not a planar, simple interface. It has some microstructure, and we see several interfaces here. And each of these interfaces, as I said, will have some energy. So first one, those in red with the index A, gamma A, would be the atomic scale energy. And here we have two kinds of interfacial energy, namely the energy of twinning planes. We have several twinning 
planes separating individual twin variants, uh, martensite variants, and each of these and each interface can be, can be understood as a kind of a defect in the crystallographic lattice. So the twin bandar energy can be interpreted or can be seen as as the as energy of, a, of, the, of the defect in the crystallographic lattice. On the other hand, there is also direct interface between martensite and austenite, and this is also, at this level, is also atomic scale energy, probably higher than, than the other one, and these are the, 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 the interfacial energies that we wish to get from the material science or from computational material science. We will take them for granted. We actually, we don't know very good values for the, these parameters, but we have some estimates and we will use these. There is also another kind of energy, which is energy of elastic microstrains in the transition layer, in the boundary layer along the interface. And this is the, what we will uh, look more at. So let's, to, to explain more about this energy, Let's do this simple experiment. We take a piece of material, we cut it into half, and then we deform the lower part in terms of, of a laminate with uh, some constant, piecewise constant shear deformation, and then we glue it again. So, of course, the material will be intact far away from the, from the interface, so there will be, but locally you need some elastic strains to accommodate, to accommodate the, the, the incompatibility. So, so then, this local incompatibility is accommodated by the elastic strains here. This, I think, can, is easily imagined. So then along the interface, we have a boundary layer, a transition layer with elastic strains, which means with elastic strain energy. And then, so at the micro scale, this is the bulk energy, which is distributed along the, uh, in the vicinity of the interface. But if we integrate and we look from the far away, from the macroscopic point of view, this is an interfacial energy, which means this is a density of energy per unit area of this macroscopic or nominal, or, or nominal interface. And also what can be shown is that this energy is proportional to the spacing here. Therefore, we can introduce a size-independent energy factor, capital gamma, so that this energy will be then the product of the two, right? of the, of the size-independent size independent energy factor gamma and the spacing H. And we will be talking a lot about, about this, this kind of, uh, of energy. And now, why would we be interested in, 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 in interfacial energies? So let's take a simple example of a twinned martensite plate. So we have a plate. This is our magnifying glass, and we see also the laminates. So this is the spacing of the twins, H, twin, and M would be the thickness of the martensite plate. If we now evaluate the total energy of interfaces in this system per unit, per unit volume, you will see two main contributions. The one with red, we see is inversely proportional to, to H twin, which means that the, the the finer the microstructure, the more energy we have in the interfaces, of course. So from that, if we want to minimize the energy, we would like to make the, 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 the microstructure as coarse as possible. However, the other term is opposite. The finer the microstructure, the, 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 so the smaller H, the lower the energy. So there is a, a, com a competition between these two terms, and if you do minimize with respect to H, we get, you get this kind of classical, classical scaling law when, when, the spacing, when the spacing of the twins is, is equal to, to the square root of the thickness of the thickness of the, of the interface, and small l is a characteristic length introduced by these two quantities in red and in blue in this picture. So this is a classical result, but we will see uh, that it also holds in, 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 more complex, in more complex situations. Okay, so if you take a bigger look at, 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 at other microstructures, so this you have already seen, but if you look, for instance, at the grain in a polycrystal, you can, you can also have direct, you see also direct austenite martensite interfaces here between the untwinned plates, in this, actually, in this material, this is copper, aluminium, beryllium, there is no twinning, but there are stacking folds on the other hand, in, so you, one could also consider that, that fact, but we will not talk about it. And then you have grain boundary, which has some energy, but on the other hand, the grain boundaries, they don't evolve, so we do not consider the, the changes in the grain boundary energy in our approach. If one has an idea how to do it, of course, can be done, can be included. And then we have the elastic microstrain energy on the left side. So this one we discussed, but we also have energy of this kind at other interfaces. So at the grain boundaries, we have martensitic plates terminating at the grain boundary. This is exactly the same kind of elastic strain energy there. 
And also we have domains, and again at, at, at the boundaries of these domains of individual laminates, we also expect energy of that kind. So these are all the kinds that, that one might be interested in to, to consider and to include in the, in the modeling. And this brings me to the concept of microstructure interfaces. So here we apply the micro and micromechanical point of view. So we distinguish between the macro scale and the micro scale. At the macro scale, the interface is a zero thickness surface. It could be a material or moving interface, depending on the system you are considering. However, if you look at the micro scale, this is a typically a layer, possibly with a microstructure. And here you have three examples. So we discussed that one, austenite twinned martensite. This can be grain boundary with martensitic plates terminating on the grain boundary. This is, for instance, in the, in the context of, of, of contact mechanics. This is also the, exactly the same kind of concept of microstructure interfaces. And now if we look to these two which are interesting for us for shape memory loss, then we can say that, see that the elastic energy here can be predicted by, for instance, by finite element computations. And that, this corresponds to kind of scale transition for the microstructured interface we have at hand. And that is what we will be doing soon. So if we now consider the austenite to martensite interface, we, we observed, we realized that the, the microstructure or morphology is not prescribed. It can deform, it can form freely, it can adapt to the conditions, and we expect that this, the material does it, the nature does it the way that the energy is minimized. And this can be modeled. So, so we apply the following approach. If we have a fixed morphology, we, ha we can solve a corresponding elasticity problem, we can compute the energy, and then we can try to improve the morphology or microstructure so that the energy is minimized. Okay? And in this approach, what we consider are the microstructures with sharp interfaces, so we do not consider any diffusive or gradient energy terms, and also, we, this is a, a little bit technical, we do not consider a twin branching. So, yeah. Okay. So how to do that in practice? So consider austenite twin martensite interface. We formulate an elasticity problem for a kind of periodic unit cell. I will show in a second. We use a finite strain uh, micromechanical framework. We consider fully elastic anisotropy and eigenstrains related to transformation strains. And then we solve the, 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 the corresponding problem uh, using the finite element method. Once we solve the problem, we can determine the energy we can integrate the in in elastic strain energy, assuming that it's zero far from the interface. We, we apply the such conditions that this condition is fulfilled. If it was not, we would have to subtract the far field fields, but this can be done also. And then we relate this energy to the area of the nominal interfaces we have in our unit cell. That's it, so we have it. We have the interfacial energy. Again, we can compute this size independent uh, energy factor capital gamma by, 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 by dividing simply by, by H, by the, by the spacing which we use actually in our computations. So here is a short outcome of the computational framework. So if one takes, chooses in a clever way the unit cell, one can formulate a two-dimensional problem actually, although all fields are 3D. So we will see in-plane dis displacements, but also, there are also out-of-plane displacements because otherwise you cannot model properly these materials. And then we do shape optimization so that the en elastic strain energy is minimized. For that, we use shape sensitivity analysis and we, we have some, some good tools to do that so we know how to, how to, how to do these terms. So here you see a, a close look to the, to the interface of a zigzag shape, one period in the, along the interface, and here are the results of the, of the analysis. So these are the results for copper aluminum nickel alloy, and in this material there are four crystallographically distinct microstructures. This is a cubic to orthorhombic transformation, and these are the results. So here you see the morphology of the interface, a close lookup, and the numbers. Okay, numbers are not much interested, but we can use them in our modeling. So we have input for our modeling. And um, not much more to say about it, but as I told you, we have now these, these new tools like phase field modeling, so we, we have tried to do the same thing using the phase field modeling, and here is the result. So we have the four microstructures and the four, four unit cells, four, four, four microstructures obtained from the from phase field modeling. So the green is the austenite, and blue and red are the two variants of martensite. 
Here we use a phase, finite strain phase field model and we solve the problem by, by finite element method. And uh, here I give some relevant re references uh, in the context of finite strain modeling, finite strain modeling, phase field modeling of martensitic uh, microstructures. So again, personally I like these microstructures, but, but again the question is how, how good they are and how do they relate to, to our previous results. So here is a small comparison for microstructure M2. If we look at the, uh, what I didn't mention is that we do the computations just for one cell and this is just repeated for better, for better visibility. So the black, black lines, they show you the actual computational cell. The rest is replication, uh, multiplication. Okay, so if we look at the morphology, morphology is more or less similar. One could maybe find some small differences, but it's not that, that different. If we look at the energies, this is the, the, the result of our sharp interface modeling by, by, by uh, shape optimization. And this is the result of phase field modeling. And here we see that you know, it's not too good. I mean, the, the result depends on the characteristic parameter for the interface thickness. Of course, if you make your interface thinner, then you resolve the, 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 the stress concentration with higher accuracy, and that's the, that's the result. But the order is more or less okay. If we take this kind of fit, we see that, of course, apparently the finest mesh we could compute, they agree nicely, but don't be misled. Of course, if we were able to compute more, we would have even higher energy. Probably we would hit the value of, say, four or something like that, so uh, in the limit. But still is not, not too bad. However, if we look to microstructure M1, again, the, the morphology is, is similar. We don't see this cusp here, but otherwise it's really, it's really similar. But the, in terms of the, of the energies, there is a big difference here. So if we adopt this fit, actually, we, actually this fit would, would go up to 12 more or less, or 12, 12 and a half. 11 and a half, sorry. So again, close, but what we see that now, it really, now the, the result of phase field modeling depends really strongly on the, on, the, on the parameter which is supposed to be just a numerical parameter. So one has to do something about it. I, I, we don't have a, a ready answer to this yet. Anyway, this is the, this is the result of this, of, this, of this analysis. Okay. That much about austenite twinned martensite in copper aluminum nickel. I just briefly show you that we also have results for nickel titanium. There are 12, 12 interfaces, nothing special. We have numbers. If one needs, one can use these energies in the, in the modeling. Something which, which I didn't mention at the beginning is also that this elastic strain energy is, is the kind of energy that I don't think one could measure, actually. The only way is to predict or inversely identify from some model. But it's not the kind of energy that you could measure like you can measure Young's modulus in the material, something like that. So we believe that, that, that modeling of this kind may be better, but still is the only approach to, to really predict these, these energies. Okay, so that much at all about Austin twin martensite interface. Now we go to the grain boundary. As I told you, Grain boundary can also be seen as a kind of microstructure interface. So imagine a grain boundary between two grains, and in one grain you have martensitic plates which t terminate at the interface. So again, there will be this kind of, of, of local strains that would accommodate incompatibility at the interface, and we would like to, to know this energy as well. So here the situation is a little bit more complex because you can imagine that that the grains are arbitrarily oriented with respect to the interface, so a lot of unknowns, and also the, the twin, fr the fraction of the, of the, uh, the, the volume fraction of the plates, of the martensitic plates, can, is also changing during the transformation. So there are a lot of unknowns, therefore we simplify the problem here, and then we adopt the assumption that we have elastic isotropy, and so that, which, which helps, reduces the, the complexity significantly for us. So at the end, we can compute the grain boundary energy using this kind of dimensionless energy factor GE star, which now depends only on four parameters, 
is still a lot, but it's, it's less than it would be without this simplifying assumption. So eta would be the volume fraction. Of course, it must depend on the volume fraction. Alpha is the inclination angle, geometrical parameter. Beta, it determines the, the orientation of the shear strain with respect to the plane of the analysis. So again, we consider fully 3D situation, just in a 2D problem, but, but with all 3D uh, stress and strain fields. And nu is the Poisson's ratio. So, so, so we can introduce this concept of, 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 of again, of the, of the energy factor. What is important that we, have, we, we also prove, I don't show you the details, that there is, a, an, there is kind of a energy superposition principle so that you can add the interfacial energy, for instance, if you have on the other side also laminate in the other grain. So these energies are additive under very weak conditions uh, to, to be fulfilled. Okay, and that's the result. So to, pr to compute this, we use the finite element method, and on this plot you see the dots. These are the results of the finite element simulations for some selected parameters. So this is the volume fraction, and then the, the geometrical parameters alpha and beta, and the solid lines is an approximation function which we happened to find quite a good approximation, as you can see, with respect to all four parameters involved, and uh, Dependence on eta is here, and dependence on alpha is just by cosine. This is just geometry, and this is related. This we take from the dislocation theory. We have guessed the dependence on beta and nu, the Poisson's ratio. Anyway, altogether, this works very nice. There's just one fitting parameter, universal parameter, equal to 0 0.197. Please remember 0 0.197. This is the fitting parameter, and we having this. This parameter, we know everything about the interfaces in isotropic, in elastically isotropic, elastically isotropic materials. Okay, so we have this, what we can do with that? What we can do is, we, or for instance, we can look at the grain. Imagine you have a spherical grain, which is an approximation of an actual grain or a subgrain in a material in which there is a periodic laminate. And then if you want to know the interfacial energy of this kind, at the grain boundary, at the boundary of this spherical grain, we just do integrate, it's not that difficult. The ga gamma E grade GB, this is the energy which in, into which we plug our approximating function, and here we get the result. And now it depends on all the parameters like eta, nu, but no longer about beta and alpha, and it depends also, of course, on the ratio of the spacing to the diameter to the diameter. So there you, you immediately have a kind of size, size effect here, size-dependent energy contribution. Okay, so we will use this, this formula later. This is for a spherical grain. And, and now I will show you some small examples. So I recall this square root, square root uh, scaling law for the martensitic plates, but we can do a similar thing for a spherical grain in 2D, which is a cylindrical grain. So this is a 2D grain. And this is the result of, of this simplified model that I showed before would, uh, that, we, that we, we, we could do by minimizing the interfacial energy with respect to the, to the, to the, to the twin spacing. And you, you have here this square root dependence. This is actually number of interfaces, but this is exactly the same as, as that uh, square root dependence one can easily show. And this here is the result of, of phase field modeling. Again, depending on the size of the grain, we get the number of interfaces. And this also is perfectly fit with the square root function with a little bit different parameter. So the difference is probably mostly to the few several issues. The first one is that we use isotropic elasticity to, to get this, while well, here we use fully anisotropic elasticity, so one has to, to, to do some simple adjust, adjustment of the energy. One could, one could do, one would, of course, then uh, have the perfect agreement, but we don't do that not to, not, not to cheat, say. Another issue is that if you look closely, the, the thickness is not uniform, while our predictions, they assume that the, 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 the laminate has a constant spacing. So this is another, another, another difference between the two. Finally, there are local, uh, we have assumed that the, that the interface is perfectly planar, while in, in practice material can, can modify slowly, slightly the shapes so that the energy is, 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 is lower at the end. Okay. And we can do similar exercise for, for uh, rank two laminate. So the scaling law is no longer a square root, but it's similar. 
is close to square root, and this is, this is the result of simple modeling, and this is the result of, 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 of phase field modeling. So here you see we have plates with, with, with substructure, with substructure here. And again, the, the scaling law is qualitatively the same. The difference is due to the same reasons and maybe more about the, the small details that, that the phase field can really minimize the energy by updating the shape next to the interface so that the energy altogether is, is minimized. Okay, so that was, the, that was about the interfacial energies at, 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 at several scales. And now we want to go to, to we want to go to uh, evolution of microstructures. For that, we need some criterion. We will use energy minimization framework, which derives from the criterion of path stability. And this goes back to the early works of Henrik Petrick, as, as, as long ago as, as 30 years ago. And in, in principle, we evaluate the evolution of microstructure by minimizing the incremental energy, delta E, and this, this is the amount of energy that is supplied to the system. In our case, when we consider isothermal quasi-static processes under kinematic control, this incremental energy is just the sum of increments in, in total Helmholtz free energy and in the dissipated energy. And this approach is, is currently very popular. There are again a lot of names, a lot of German names actually in between them, so probably, and some of, 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 of the authors probably are here at, at, in the room. So this is a, a, a very powerful and, and, and popular approach at the moment. So what we do, we just consider our energy, to, to, to free energy, to be composed of the bulk size independent contribution. We know how to do, as in our models, or the traditional models, and then we also add the interfacial energy, which is a sum of interfacial energy at individual scales that we, that we consider. And then, in particular, we have these two types of, of contributions, the atomic scale energy and the elastic microstrain energy, which we predict using our micromechanical, micromechanical schemes. We do the similar thing about the dissipation. So we consider bulk dissipation, where we put all that we don't know, and assume this one is, is size independent, rate independent, and size independent. And then we have also interfacial energy related to the individual uh, levels of, of microstructure. And here we adopt a, an assumption. One can agree, one cannot. That this is our assumption, where we assume that the negative increments of inf interfacial energy, they contribute to dissipation. So you, you, if you think that you deform your material, you, 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 you enforce, you induce some new interfaces, which means that you pump energy, into the free energy into the system. However, whenever an interface disappears, it is a dynamic, system, this dynamic event, and this energy cannot be reverted to useful free energy, so it's dissipated. And this is our assumption, and we assume that essentially all of these energies, so these kappas, are close to unity, and all, whenever the interfacial energy decreases, we assume that this is contributes to, to, to dissipation. And that, that way we get size-dependent uh, contribution to the total dissipation. Okay, and a few examples now. Not much time left, but still, okay, 15 minutes we should, we should do, 10, 15 minutes. Okay, so first, I show you some results of only qualitative analysis. I will not go into detail to take too much time, but we did stability analysis of evolving laminates, okay? So if you consider that this gray material is a laminate which evolves, so, so that the volume changes, the, vo the, um, the uh, volume fraction of, of, of the phases changes during, during your process, and then you can check that actually this kind, and, and, but this, um, this laminate is infinitely fine, so we have no characteristic length scale. So one can check, one can show that this kind of evolving laminate is essentially unstable. It's a bad news, actually. It will localize into a band, so if you think of a, of a loading case, of a loading of a, such a specimen of the material, one part will stay without increments of the, of, the, of, the, of the volume fraction, and only you would have a localization band in which the deformation would proceed. So it's not a good news for us, because we like laminates, we assume, or we do all our modeling in laminates, and then it doesn't do work as, as, we, as, we, proceed, as we assumed, right? Because we have this, 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 uh, this localization. 
Luckily, luckily, we have interfacial energy. And when the, the basic assumption here was that the, the microstructure was infinitely fine. But I have never seen an infinitely fine, I believe no one has seen. So the actual microstructures, they are not infinitely fine. And it's a good news for us, because if we have a finite microstructure with some character, finite characteristic length, then if you consider kind of localization mode shown here, we apply here HLB's uh, inclusion concept and etc. I don't elaborate much about it. Anyway, one can show that then if, if the material wanted to do, to localize in such a mode, there would be some small interfacial energy contributions of the kind of the elastic microstrain energy I was discussing before. And that energy stabilizes the, the laminate. So at the end, we, the, thanks to the interfacial energy, this, this evo such an evolving laminate is stable. So it's a good news for us. We can still uh, stay in the world of, of evolving laminates, which we, which we like. And this condition is, is safely fulfilled for, for, more for most of the practical situations. Okay. So if we can do laminates, let's do laminates. So here is uh, one example. When we take an idealized SMA polycrystal, you probably, those who work in polycrystal, do not recognize the polycrystal here. I agree, it's a highly idealized polycrystal. So you imagine you take uh, the each grain, Bandar is a plane, so each grain is like a pancake or like a pizza. You, you assemble two kinds of pizza in a, a parallel manner, in a special arrangement, such that, such that we also use kind of uh, symmetric relations to, 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 to reduce number of unknowns in this system. But at the end, if we assume that each of these grains transforms through formation of a laminate, then at the end, Considering also lower, lower uh, laminates in the, in the martensitic plates, the twinned laminates, what we get is a rank three laminate. And up, up, after doing this high idealization, uh, this assumption of, of, of this kind of microstructure, further on, we can apply our micromechanical tools. And for laminates, we have exact micro to macro scale transitions. That's why we use this, of course. So now, since after adopting this assumption, the rest is, is, is really strict. The analysis is strict. So we consider interfacial energy at three scales. So starting from the bottom, we have twin boundaries here, the energy, which we get hopefully from the material science. Then we have austenite twinned martensite interface. Here we have two contributions, atomic scale energy along the zigzag interface here, and the elastic microstrain energy, the one that we predicted, that one that we computed. So that's the austenite martensite interface, here seen already from the ma macro perspective, assuming some kind of, of uh, scale separation. And finally, we have grain boundaries, at which again we have ma martensitic Sorry, martensitic plate terminating at the interface, which means that again we have this kind of elastic microstrain energy. Okay, and then we apply incremental energy minimization framework, and as a result, we get evolution of the microstructure. In this simple case, the microstructure, the, the grain size B is fixed because this is the grain boundaries do not evolve, but the, the spacing of the martensitic plates, the thickness of the martensitic plates, and the spacing of the twin of the twins, these are the microstructure parameters, and these are determined from the incremental energy minimization. And here is the result. So this is the kind of stress-strain uh, response that we get for this, for this specific material. So no, 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 not, not only we get the macroscopic response, mechanical response of stress in terms of strain, but also at each particular point along this hysteresis loop, we get the, uh, the microstructure. By the, by, by the microstructure, I mean, mean not only the volume fractions of the phases, but the actual thicknesses of the individual elements of the microstructure. So here is the close-up. So the austenite here is uh, transparent, and you see the thickness of the, of the plate. And this is the scale, 10 microns. So the thickness is probably below 1 micron. Here you see, again, the, the, the plate and the, the scale for the, for the twins. And yeah. So this is all predicted in the incremental manner, the evolution of, this, of, this, of these parameters. And this is done without introducing any artificial parameters. We only use 
essentially these two parameters, the three, yeah, three parameters that we need. We need the atomic scale energies and then our estimates for the, for the elastic strain, for the elastic strain energy. Okay, so this is the effect of the grain size of this specific grain size on the macroscopic response and what we see that the smaller the grain, the larger the hysteresis and also the, the, the transformation strain for initiation increases. So this is a kind of similar effect to the whole patch effect. Smaller is stronger in this, in this, in this range of, of, of grain sizes at least. Yeah, not much more to say about that. So this is the, the first example and final example where we have included the interfacial energy into a more general uh, model for, for a SMA polycrystal. And uh, so as a starting point, we take the model that we have developed, which we call a big crystal aggregate model. And in this model, we assume that the material is essentially not an aggregate of the grains, but an aggregate of big crystals. And each big crystal is a grain boundary with the adjacent parts of, of the two grains. In that way, we can account for the interaction of neighboring grains. The result is that, for instance, the simple Taylor and Zachs bounds are significantly improved. But I don't elaborate more. Anyway, we have the model, and for that model, we want to put, we want to enhance this model with the interfacial energy. So we, we consider this kind of spherical grain, which we, for which we know how to estimate the elastic strain energy. We, con we consider all the individual interfacial energy contributions that might appear in that system, and this is the result. So if we do that, we have the material response of this kind, again, depending on the, on the grain size. So the green would be the large grain, smaller effect, and the blue would be smaller grain with a big effect of, of, the, of the interfacial energy. Of course, you see a severe softening here, so you don't expect to observe such a response in practice for an actual specimen. So this is just a simple, uh, we, we, we make a simple scenario taking the, the Maxwell line and localization criterion. This is just a, in, in the sketch of how the actual response of a, of a specimen might look like. Anyway, again, what we have here is that the, the energy, the dissipated energy, which is the, 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 the area of this hysteresis loop, does depend on the, on the grain size. And this is in agreement, and actually it increases with decreasing grain size. And this is, there are not many results in the, in the literature on that, but those that are, that are available, they show exactly the same trend. So with decreasing grain size, you have increasing, increasing uh, this energy dissipation. In this. So qualitatively, we represent these, these effects by our, by our modeling. Okay, so this brings me to the summary. So I have shown you uh, a micromechanical sharp interface model. Uh, and uh, in this model, we include the interfacial energy at different scales, in particular of two origins, the atomic scale energy and inter elastic microstrain energy. And in this modeling approach, the microstructure evolution is determined by incremental energy minimization, very general framework, but finds very good application here. I have also shown you that the interfacial energy does stabilize the, ev the evolu evolution of, of laminates, which are otherwise unstable. And we have some quantitative evaluation of size effects without introducing any artificial length scale parameters. So in particular, we, we could show you, we could uh, derive some kind of grain dependence of the, of, the macroscopic, of the macroscopic response. And also I showed you uh, first results of our phase field modeling of, 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 related, of related phenomena. Okay, and with that, I could uh, say thank you and leave you with this uh, Easter egg. But before doing that, you might ask, what are these strange arrows with this egg? So I leave you with the explanation in this figure, and I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Subkiewicz, for this impressive lecture, which I think made really clear that uh, one cannot understand the microstructure and uh, its evolution without uh, taking into account uh, interfacial energy. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.
And uh, as you know, questions are not allowed, but you are free to approach uh, Professor Subkiewicz in the coffee break. Thank you again.